Hi Mackies, how are you my lovies? Thank you for coming back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, please do consider subscribing once we're in like a good minute of this video. Um, for today's video, we're going to be doing a book review, so I'm very excited about that. We're going to have a book review. Um, child, there's just something about me and these glasses, like, I don't know man, like, I don't know, I think they're like, I don't know, they're very important for every video I make, so. Mm. But I always have to like, take them out do you take them out yeah you take them out i don't know but yeah um cool anyway um we're gonna be doing a book review by naidu beverly the book is the other side of truth honestly this is a great read uh it's the best read i've had in a very long time because i've been reading a lot of statistical political books like a lot of numbers a lot of history a lot of memorizing a lot it's more like study based that i've been reading so this was really a good book to unwind and i suppose that's because i didn't necessarily need to pay as much attention so let me give you first a background on who beverly naidu is i'll be referring to my notes probably a few times in this video so please bear with me um so beverly naidu was born on the 21st of may 1943 so she's like 78 years old she has quite a few books this is the only book of hers that i've read can you see that hmm i like the focus like there isn't a lot of distractions and stuff well her books are journey to Joburg, which she published in 18 in 1985 the other side of truth which is this book which was in 2000 and then there's out of bounds in 2001 there's burn my heart in 2007 there's chain of fire in 1989 there is a web of lies that she published in 2004 and there is no turning back that she published in 1994 there are quite other few books so if you're kind of interested in knowing more about who beverly naidu is go on google go on wherever you get your internet or whatever go there you'll find a lot of information on her she is currently in the united states but she is a South African author. I think she moved to the United Kingdom in around her 20s. Um, yeah, so she was pretty much born during apartheid. And that's probably what led to her moving to Europe. So, you know how it was? Like, I'm pretty sure most of us have uncles that moved to that side, have family members that moved that side. Because it was just hectic during apartheid. But anyway um for the purpose of this review this book review um it's fictional like i said but there are quite a few true things that happened like um there's a character in the book barake sarawa wiwa so i'm just gonna read that bit so you kind of like have context on it um it's here it says the characters in this his in this story are fictional. However, we hear about three political figures who were real people. Ken Sarawiwa, as a well-known Nigerian writer, he protested in Ogunland. His birthplace has been pop has been polluted and robbed by multinational oil companies and the military government. He was hanged with eight others in November 1995. Like that's pretty hectic. But anyway. Um, the novel is set immediately after this event when Nigeria was under the rule of the Detector General Abacha. Quite a name. He has since died quite unexpectedly in 1998. And a year later, the government was handed over to a democratically elected president. So we still know that Nigeria is still... It's, it's pretty well developed or kind of it's getting there it's not the most developed country but um man man we we're trying we're all trying hey but like at least now they have a democratically elected president which means they have a they're a democratic country now there is fairness equality of sorts because we're still in south africa and there isn't necessarily equality but that's what we're striving towards the main thing is that we are a democratic country and we can one day get where we are hoping to get and the third 
real figure in this novel is President Barry, whom Miriam mentions. Miriam is one of the characters. We'll get into the characters of this book. Um, whom Miriam mentions when telling her story about fleeing from Somalia. Barry was a military... I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, if it's Barry or Bar, but he was that president. Um, Bar was a military ruler who dealt very harshly with rebel groups. In 1988, Northern Somalia. In 1988, the government planes bombed the city of Haregia in Northern Somalia. Man, I'm not sure how I'm pronouncing these names, but I just hope I'm pronouncing them correctly. And um, this is where Miriam lived, and it was from here that her father was taken by soldiers, the journey on foot and by donkey that she made to Mohadisho in the south was over 600 miles. President Barr fled abroad in 1991, and at that time of writing, Somalia had still not settled central, had, had still no settled central government. Um, the north was... The North has been the most peaceful region. It declared itself as an independent country, which is Somaliland, but it is still waiting for the world to recognize it. So those are the only true characters. Those are the only real characters in this book. Otherwise, everyone else is fictional. Now let's get into the characters of this book. The characters are Folosade. Folo yeah, Folosade, but you pronounce it Shade. That's Shade half for Folosade. And then um, she has a brother, Femi. So the the main character, who's Shade, is a high school... She's high school aged. She has a brother who's in grade 6, which is Femi. And her father is quite an enemy of the state, or rather, should I say, the military government. Because they talk about brass buttons, and brass buttons are the military people, the soldiers, and they were quite the rulers or rather they had this dictatorship you know like their state was their government was ran by military people and she has an uncle Baraki uncle Dele and then this uncle Tunde um and a few other characters but like the main characters or rather people we should look out for in this book is Femi um her sister which is the main character Shade the father Mrs. Graham Miss Afia and who else? We'll get into that. We'll we'll see how that goes. So um this was honestly the best read like I've told you guys and also um there are a few things that I want us to actually check or rather pay attention to in this book or rather the main ideas that I want us to like discuss around. Firstly, that is grief. That is also honesty. That is the importance of family. And that is adapting and responding to our environments. We're going to talk about these things in no particular order. I don't want to say step one, we're going to be talking about grief. But then I end up actually adding things that have to do with family. While that, because they're all kind of interrelated. But we can, if you're alone and you want to listen to this clearly... You'd actually have to separate it for yourself because I'm basically going to be talking about everything combined because that's just how it is, right? So, um, let's get into it. I said in no particular order. So, it's basically like four or five things that is adapting and responding to our environment. So, that's basically like two things and two things. Um, grief, honesty, and family. So, right at the beginning... This could be more in the context of grief and family, but I don't want to classify it specifically as such or exclusively as such because it might cause creation, confusion. It might cause confusion and you really need to follow. So, um, but I'm going to try to simplify it or give like a like non-confusing, clear, conscientious, <laughs> concise, um, I love me my water. Stay hydrated, guys. Anyway, right in the beginning of this book, The Other Side of Truth, Shade loses her mom in a shooting. So that is quite tragic, right? Especially considering that this is a children's book. That's pretty hectic because now you like it kind of already exposes children to a world of violence while we should actually be protecting our children from that. 
but also while protecting them from that we shouldn't make it as if we shouldn't make it seem like that is a thing that does not exist as if violence is non-existent if anything we actually need to talk about it and teach our children in a manner that is responsible so if i were the author of this book because i'm not pretty sure if there's an age restriction i don't even know if no but there is an age restriction to books but then i don't know to this book specifically but if i were the author i would have like put maybe a pg-13 or i don't know when the appropriate age is to expose children to violence but yeah that's just the first thing i would change but otherwise it is a very good read so now i said i wanted to talk about grief in this particular instance where the shooting took place so right after that normally if there's a passing we're probably going to have a moaning period where we actually because we're still in a state of shock and we need to like accept that okay realize that oh my word this just happened um can you just take time to acknowledge it let it sink in cry if we need to of course you don't need to but like just cry if you need to and just feel your emotions you know like mourn man because like you this person once loved their your mother and they had they played a very huge impact in your life and if you're quite young and you didn't expect this this was like very random well it was well thought through but it was very random because like you're on your way going to school you're struggling packing your bags into school because that's what happened to Shade. she was struggling to pack her bags into her school into a school bag um i don't know like yeah her, you know how it gets it's it sometimes gets messy bruh like you need to take stuff out again and then repack your books so she was kind of in that situation where she had to repack her books so while that happened those brass but those brass buttons which are the military or the soldiers they came shooting but here's the thing the mother was not the target the mother was not the target as per usual the father was the target but this time for not so obvious reasons i say for not so obvious reasons because usually if the target is the father the that is usually because they're either involved in some illegal money laundering business they're either involved in some drugs like it always has to do with like illegal stuff or money or i don't know but like it's never necessarily dignified reasons it's never necessarily respectable reasons but however with their father mr dr solaja that's his surname um he is a journalist or was a journalist i'm gonna speak in the past tense because this was long ago bruh um he was a journalist um, for a newspaper, I have no idea. Like, I'm gonna lie if I told you what newspaper this was, ne? But um, he was a journalist for a newspaper, so like, there wasn't a lot of media, or rather, a lot of things were censored, and people would like get killed for expressing the truth, writing the truth, reporting on the truth, and such stuff. So, Dr. Solaja was very brave with as re with regards to that he was very determined on giving the truth because he felt that the children or rather our children or our future um deserves to know the truth so he was very adamant as far as honesty is concerned as far as being reliable and honest and actually human he was big on human rights human justice all those things so he was reporting the truth against the brass button so he was that definitely made him a target and they obviously wanted to silence him hence they silenced this sarawo wiwa person in the book because um with the in in his actual life sarawo they talk about um oil companies but in the book it's more political based reasons but they don't necessarily go into depth with that so that is one thing that we wanted to talk that i want us to talk about how now suddenly this these children's mother just died but she wasn't necessarily the target so this took them aback it was sudden and they were literally on their way to school so you can imagine that you wake up at 5 a.m it is a normal school day like everything is supposed to go smoothly like normally and then next thing, Khwatunyana, like literally shots are being shot at your mother, in your house, in your yard, 
and now suddenly life is about to change life is literally about to drastically change because now you're an orphan or rather semi orphan because you still have a father um you're no longer going to school now you literally need to move out of your country can you see how dramatic that is can you see what a drastic change that is so i could um after that happened their uncle dunde came um because there was this um a person i i would say a gatekeeper because they kind of talk they don't necess- a helper he's a male helper they don't necessarily go into depth with his role in in the household but um usually he he runs errands for them sometimes he helps them with stuff so i would say he's like a helper or a family friend someone that's just always there and you know you can rely on that's the kind of person that person is i forgot his name but i will remember his name but his name is not necessarily important in this case so but he was the first person that saw that and was able to help and their father came outside and that is when life started changing because it was quite evident that these are this was that they're not done basically they're not done they're not done at all they're still going to come to him they're still going to come for him and his family like until he is destroyed they are not going to stop so shortly after that their uncle tunde who is a lawyer came and he is also very diligent in his work he is like they usually said that um he's like a detective in his work he should have become a detective instead of becoming a lawyer because that's just how diligent he is with his work and how committed he is how thorough he is with his work so he arranged to get fake passports for this mr for Mr. Dr. Solaja or Mr. Solaja the journalist Shade's father so that was also very interesting how now this honest figure now just made or rather this honest figure now has worked or had to like cut a few things and actually get what should i say now cut corners basically um so um he got <laughs> he got them or rather got the father a fake passport and like take note of this fake passport thing because it's going to be important towards the end of the video or as the story goes on right and then um he got an agent or rather someone to um find someone that can actually take the kids which is Shade and Femi and smuggle them out of the country to England because that is the only place they would be safe as they also have an uncle that side which is uncle Dele so he's the only person that is in the united that is in the that is in Europe and can provide them with safety correct so right after that um he got there and what happened was um the agent found someone um Mrs Graham no they found Mrs Bangole so Man- Mrs Bangole is also very vital in the story what happened with Mrs Bangole is that um she she had two children um they also gave the children's names but guys i don't think the names are necessarily for that but basically now um the kids were around about her t- Shade and Femi were around about the age of her children's so that was going to make it very easy for her to actually smuggle the kids out of the country right to all the way to England so um what happened was um fine um they got the agent and now it was a matter of them leaving so while they were left in the study they actually had like a mini conversation with their father because like this was a shock this had this was very sudden and now there's a lot of changes taking place now they they need to leave their home country like they can't even stay behind for their mother's funeral so it was very hectic in that regard or in that case so yeah man it was tough like it was tough like i cannot imagine having personally went through loss myself like i cannot personally imagine what they must have gone through because i'm pretty sure they've gone 10 times what they went through was like 10 times worse than what i've personally been through so like that is very hectic and also considering their ages as well that is a lot of strain for anyone grief and loss is a lot of strain for anyone now imagine a high school aged child and a primary aged child imagine how that affects them personally because that's also their mental health that is also their their 
performance at school is affected their livelihoods are affected like they are just affected like literally just drastically affected and that can deteriorate anyone's mental health at cool so after they found the agent um uncle dela went back to the house and they were like okay he was like okay look guys um you guys need to like leave the country as soon as possible and you're gonna do that tonight mind you that is the very same day they lost their mother so imagine today what day is it today i'm not wearing my watch imagine today is i'm assuming today's the yeah it's the 27th so right today's the 27th right this evening my mother died at 8 a.m literally at 6 or 4 p 4 4 p.m in the afternoon i'm told that yo you guys need to leave the country at 8 p.m because that is just how hectic it is these people are gonna come and get you like you guys like after this like it's gonna be done with y'all like you need to leave the country as soon as possible so what then happens is that uncle Dele, then um he had i think um what's that those cars those um um those mortuary cars man those very big ones hash yeah hash so can took a hearse yeah cool <laughs> so i cool then they get a hearse i'm assuming that's what his car was because they don't was like because they don't necessarily have pictures in those book but that's the kind of mental picture that it paints for us that his car was like a hearse because he was also able to hide the kids um with that he was able to hide the kids with a blanket and then what happened right after that was that he was um then he left so like they had to be very cautious because there's also um policemen traffic officers and they're also easy to bribe as well but then it was very crucial that they be careful of that because they could think that he is kidnapping the kids or anything. And actually, he was kidnapping them because he was actually taking them. Go, he was about to smuggle them out of the country and had paid someone to do that. But also, it is important that we realize that it was for the kids' safety. So, um, he takes the children and he is able to finally get to the airport after having passed i think they were stopped twice by policemen but then there was this one time where they were almost caught they were almost caught and then he explained to the officer that no he is just going to be he's just going to throw away oh he has rubbish he was taking out but then he's on his way to the airport to fetch his mother but he covered the rubbish with um with blankets so that his mother does not say that she raised a lazy untidy son right interesting and that was also very smart of him it was actually a smart lie so okay that is what happens and then they finally get to the airport and this is when a lot of disastrous stuff happen and also it adds a lot onto their mental health as well because that what happened from there like the story just it gets worse like the amount of stress gets worse the amount of distress like it's the suffering like it just it increases dude like it just increases so much but right after that, what happened when they get to the airport, guys? Yo, when they get to the airport, cool. They pass through. Let me say smoothly because this is quite a long story, and we're already twenty three minutes into the video, and I don't want it to be too long. But okay, cool. Um, they get through the airport. They finally arrive in England, right? So once they finally, there was also a time when Femi wanted to like run away, but then they had to think of their father because if they were to run away their father would start looking for them and he'd probably have to go to the police and when he goes to the police they're obviously going to alert the brass buttons and that's going to be quite problematic and detrimental to their situation right so okay cool they moved they finally landed safely in england i think they were given like five pounds but before they were given five pounds that was immediately after they actually arrived in england um after they had passed the process whatever process it is oh i have a watch on now lol after they um passed the whatever process you have to like do when like customs and all those stuff um miss van Kohler was kind of searched because she could be selling um she could be smuggling drugs into the country into england remember they're all the way from nigeria so um what happened after that was 
uh, Mr. Bangkole was waiting for Miss Bangkole. Hectic. Now, Mr. Bangkole did not know that Miss Bangkole had smuggled children into the country, taken money to actually fly the kids across the country, or do you say across the country? Across the world, across the continent, to another continent. And that was, I don't know, but like the way he is painted in the book, he seems as though he is a very violent, controlling man. Yeah, it's really like the bit, the five sentences that spoke about him because they didn't talk too much about him. The five sentences that they shared about him kind of gave that description. And so, mm, so what happened, um, Ms. Van Kole was like, okay, let's not talk in front of the kids. I will explain to you what's going on, what happened, and what's going to happen. So he gives Femi and Shade five pounds to go into the restaurant and buy, um, buy coke or get something to like eat and drink i don't know how many how much five pounds are in south african rands so um after that what happens is they now now shade and femi are in the restaurant and they get coke and chocolate cake each and now they're left with like 80 cents so they were like halfway through their meal and then they realize yo but like what happened to Miss Bankole and Mr. Bankole? Because, like, they seem out of sight. So they go out to check where these people are. And they're out of sight. Like, they ran away. Miss Bankole left them there. They're like, okay, let's wait for, like, 10 more minutes. She's probably going to come back. Like, they just had to, like, talk like adults and stuff. Like, let's give them 10 minutes and see what happens. Mind you, they're in a foreign country. They do not have parents. They do not have much money but 80 cents. Like, literally 80 cents. 80 pennies right 80 pennies yeah so like they literally like don't have anything really they don't have anything they wait for 10 minutes Ms. Van Kole does not show up she remembers that her father gave her an address but then she gave that little note where the address was written on to Ms. Van Kole because she wanted to see where the place was it was um the the college of arts somewhere in oxford if i'm not mistaken oxford or london but like yeah somewhere there and um miss van Kole was nowhere to be found but then she remembered that there was a 30 something bus that she had to take the bus was 36 but that she didn't necessarily remember until she started seeing buses numbered 36 38 and she was like oh yeah bus 36 that's the bus we're gonna take but we only have 38 but we only have 80 pennies like what are we gonna do so hopefully that's enough okay they go and then they ask um the bus the bus driver or conductor or whoever whatever you call those people and they're like um exactly they actually had enough money like 80 cents was like literally i'm gonna keep saying cents because i can't keep saying pennies pennies penny can i have a penny for your thought penny for your thought penny yeah 80 cents. We're going to stick with 80 cents. So, I cool. Um, 80 cents was, like, literally enough for that bus. So, like, that was, like, a really good saving. Like, that was, like, that was just, like, grace, dude. That was just, like, light and mercy following them. Like, that was very nice. So, they get there to the College of Art. Um, they get to the reception. They ask for Dr. Solaja because, remember, Uncle Dele? His surname is Dr. Salaja, their father, Dr. Salaja as well. So they ask for him and then the receptionist is like, um, we actually haven't seen this person. I haven't seen this person around in days, but um, let me call the department. She calls the department, asks for Uncle Dele. Um, apparently he hasn't been seen for weeks now. Now like, it gets hectic for the children. And now remember, here's the way the honesty part comes in. Um, the woman asks, like, um, are you a relative of his? Like, what's going on? Do you need him? Like, what can I do? Um, can I leave a message? The children are like, um, no, no message. Um, he's a family friend, actually. Thank you. Bye. They leave. They don't know where they're going. They have no one now at this point because Uncle Dele is missing. They literally don't have anyone okay they start like roaming the streets they have no money they haven't eaten the last meal they had was um the last proper meal they had was the meal their mother made the night before she died and the last 
snack they had was that that they had when they arrived in london so that's probably going to sustain them for probably like an hour or two right if we're being realistic because they haven't had any proper food in a while so okay they leave um they're roaming around the streets of london and now they need it's it's flipping cold like it's cold like it's early cold like it is so cold like shivering cold like a of as well like they're cold and now they need to find shelter they need to find somewhere to sleep they find an alley to sleep but there's other street people there's other hobos there's other people that actually own that place so um they get to that spot apparently someone already owns that place and then they get whatever little stuff that they had gets taken away from them because now yo this is my spot and everything in this spot is mine so that's what happened and then they get to a video shop um they get in there but to their misfortune other kids from england got went into the video shop vandalized the shop and then the shop owner phoned the police and then what happened after that was um what happened after that was now the police the police came and after they came the shop owner's like yo i know these kids i know that these kids work together and now what are you gonna do with them the police is like but there isn't what evidence you have there isn't enough evidence to substantiate what you're saying so there's there was a policeman and a policewoman and then the policewoman starts asking the kids questions like who are you where are you from but like Shade and Femi were not saying anything mind you these kids are terrified they want to tell the truth but they cannot tell the truth because they do not know that their father is in England yet or not so that is quite problematic because if they tell the police the truth tell them who they are how they got here that means their father gets into trouble and that also now she also remembers that miss bangole had told her that if you tell me if you tell the police that if you tell on me basically if you tell the police that i'm the one that helped you get here my the agent is no longer going to help your father and also the police are going to be on your father so that's kind of like a threat because already their father is in trouble if i can put it like that because my remember the brass buttons or rather all the way back in nigeria their government is ruled by the military so when if they would if their father was to get deported or get reported now they're going to know where he is that's going to put his family in danger again so they keep getting into this web of lies like it keeps just getting it keeps getting deeper and deeper thicker and thicker like it's just it becomes so suffocating right and then i cool after that um they were now um they got assigned social workers i think her name is jenny miss jenny but she gave her name iwa jenny and after that once she got the um a social worker they were assigned a, a, a an, an emergency house or an emergency home just for the night or two nights just so that they could be safe until everything is sorted out and they know what's actually happening are these kids orphans um are these kids refugees like what's going on so miss jenny finds them a house and this is where miss graham comes in so um Miss Graham has three kids. She has twins and she has a child named Kevin. And Kevin also becomes um an important figure or, ca or character in the story later on but not so much. Um and then they stay there for like 2 days until they get another um uh, until they get assigned another house because they would like to get um them a black family a black african family but that is also only after miss jenny the social worker had found out that um they're actually from nigeria and they came here through a lady she didn't say shade never mentioned the name bangole she just said we came here through a lady so she was basically miss jenny was asking questions and then she was basically just nodding yes or no like literally did you eat did you have water what do you want to do?
basically that is what was happening throughout the whole thing until they finally got a family mr and mrs king they were assigned to that family or rather that family adopted them and they were to start school now do do you see how crazy this is like you literally lost your mother yesterday your life was normal until 8 a.m and then at 6 p.m you moved to another country a whole new continent different continent where you don't know anyone you find out that the person that was supposed to take care of you is not here yet you do not even have time to process your grief like you're literally just bottling all these things in like taking life's attacks just like this life life right and center like literally from every angle like that can be i i honestly i cannot like i don't know how they made it through i don't know how they made it through dude like it, it's crazy like that is crazy it's so crazy like i remember i was reading this book and like i got to the part where they were exchanging letters and i was like bro people go through this because as much as it's fictional it's actually very realistic these are things that some people actually go through okay cool let me not dwell too much into that um um they got mr and mrs king and then there was another uh, miss afia she was like one of the refugees um kind of organizer or but like she was like one of the regulating bodies of the refugees and then there was Mr. Nathan who was a lawyer and was trying to get them temporary admission until they could sort out everything and then have the whole story sorted out because no one really knew what was going on with them. They didn't really tell much because they also couldn't tell. It was just a matter of um, these are our names and they gave them the wrong surname saying um, they were Adewale, Adewale or Adwell. I don't know because like the spellings child. But yeah, I'm going to say Ada Wale because it was literally spelled like that. Aid, Ade, Whale, Wale. Literally like that. So Ada Wale. Ada Wale. Ada Wale. I'm not even an I'm a piano child. Um... <laughs> okay, the whole I'm a piano thing just kind of threw me off. But anyway um after that happened this miss afia then um has business or has a meeting with some of the prisoners and at a prison what was the prison but it was also in oxford it was also in oxford and then what happened was um she and then oh yeah their father finally made it to England, but now he's in prison because he was so frantic that he doesn't know where his children are. Like, he was so worried about his children that he did not follow the necessary procedure and claim political asylum immediately as soon as he arrived. And then they caught him that they caught out that he was um, using a fake passport. So they had to send him to prison and now they're on the verge of deporting him back to Nigeria where his life is going to be in danger. But luckily or fortunately, Miss Afia was there and then he overheard the conversation that she was having with one of the prisoners. And so um, she asked her if she perhaps by any chance knows a Shade and a Femi Solaja. And a Femi Solaja. Um, Miss Afia was like, no, um, I know Adewele's, I know them. And then she's like, I, and then the father told her that Adewele is their father, is their mother's surname and explained the whole story, what happened, who he is. And he also like to provide evidence on who he is. He showed her, uh, some of the articles that he had written in the newspaper so that was that kind of like saved it that was like kind of like where the silver lining was now like coming you know i right, cool and then after that happened they got a call and remember like now they had started school there was bullying involved that is another thing that brings me to adapting to our environments because um she found she made a friend called miriam and miriam um was also a refugee um there was a, the that's where the rebel groups came come in um their father was giving assistance or was helping um hide the rebel groups 
I, um, from the military because um, Somali Somalia was also mil- was also a military government, mil- military ran government. Like this, so dramatic. Like this, so unnecessary. But anyway, um, that is what happened. And now she explained the whole story. I'm not gonna get into Miriam's story because that is not particularly important for this video or for this book. I can say. And um, there was another Moshia she disliked or rather hated African people, but her grandmother was Jamaican, which base she's black. Well, it's not that obvious, but means she's black. And also, obviously, Jamaicans aren't necessarily from Africa, but they are of African descent, right? Well, that's if I have my geo correct, because Jamaica is in South America, right? Yeah, it's in South America. So, yeah, um, where she was now being picked on, was being bullied, and she had to, like, adapt to that. And she one time gave in and stole from Miriam's uncle's shop. And But apparently Miriam knew and Marcia had also done that. So, like, their relationship for, I think, a good two weeks, if I can say, was not necessarily the best until they finally found out what was actually happening with Shade and Femi. So, um, I explained that their father could not receive any help because, um, he had claimed political asylum a bit too late and no one believed him. And this is what the Nigerian government did. Here's what they did. What they did was, um, they now changed the story. They flipped the story and said that Dr. Salaja is the one that killed his wife. Whereas that is not what happened. They were the one that killed his wife. So now he's all the way in Britain. And now that is causing more trouble for him in Britain. And mind you, he does not have his kids. He recently just lost the wife. And like, there's a lot going on. So luckily or fortunately, Miss Afia was able to help with that. And now there was also um the 7 o'clock news. Um, apparently that was part of BBC or that was separate. I'm not going to get too into that because I might actually end up lying. But... With that, what happened was um, Shade was very familiar with this and um, the news world, the journalistic world, the research world, because that is what his father did, what her father did for a living, right? So she went to the presenter, like there was this one day after school, um, they literally him, they literally went um, to get, try and get help or assistance for his father. They went to the station the radio station, the building, whatever that is. They went to that and they literally stood there from like 5 p.m. till 8 p.m. just to like get help because they knew that the presenter would only walk out sometime around 8. He only did that around 8.30. Mind you, it was very cold. Like, it was so cold. Like, they talk about shivering. Like, I could literally imagine imagine that. Like, they, I could imagine them beavering and stuff. So... Um, they waited, they were so cold, when he finally came out, they were so cold, like, (laughs) they say their bones were brittle, brittle, sorry, I'm gonna try to, like, pronounce my words, like, to articulate my words properly, because apparently I do not utter my words coherently, (laughs) anyway, that is what happened and then um he finally and then he took notice of them because he couldn't necessarily really hear them that's how cold they were um so what got the attention was Femi falling at his feet like that's literally how cold he was and unable to necessarily move because mind you it's snowing it's really cold and they've been standing outside since 5 p.m and it's now 8 30 p.m and then he took them into the building made them a hot drink and then started they started sharing their story that um I am I am Shade. This is my brother Femi Solaja. We are Mr. Solaja's children. We're all the way from America. we're all the way from Nigeria. We were smuggled by a lady this side and then she just abandoned us. Our uncle Dele, who has been missing and they say my father has no children, but here we are. So um, if he were to get deported back to Nigeria, it could cause more trouble and gave all the story. And then the presenter was like, um, okay, we're going to do like more research into this. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. We will try by all means to help you. And then they were finally on the news. 
now they literally these kids literally saved their father so because um femi is primary age and in grade six i'm assuming that would be 13 years of age 12 years of age and um shade being high school aged i would assume that is somewhere from 14 because like i think it was her first year of high school so i would say 14 to 16 years of age she was there about so they actually did a very good job and actually they are the ones that saved their father's case like that is crazy like these kids saved their father's age they fa they saved their father's case and they were able to get assistance um and then what happened was i keep saying and then what happened i say that a lot don't i and then what happened after that was from then on it kind of the process was kind of it kind of went smoothly they got assistance their father even went on a hunger strike he wasn't taking any food at all and then that was also that became detrimental to his health until he had to like actually be released from prison and then um it seemed that they actually had to like let him out because they didn't want him to die at their hands and then he was reunited with his kids in the king's house remember i said the kids were adopted by mr and mrs king so from then on they started it was just now a matter of them having to like just grief like go through stuff and finally get to a better life or now start normalizing or being normal again because now life will never be the same they lost their mother and they still have this whole thing to deal with this whole deportation thing to deal with they're still now considered refugees their father is in political asylum um and now they were granted six months in england so that after all those storms they had faced they were finally glad that now at least even though it's just six months and then they might have to go through the same thing after six months again six months again at least now they were together with their family or together as a family and would now be able to just be at peace if that is what they could get if that is not a bit too far-fetched considering how much they've actually been through because there is a lot of adapting to do there is a lot of talking to do there is a lot of feeling to do there is a lot of giving themselves grace to do and they were very grateful for everything that has happened so that was that is basically it i could go more into detail but this video is long enough already there is a story about the tortoise and about the tortoise and the leopard i think or the tortoise and something but it's basically just a story about courage it's a story about courage and how yeah the leopard and the tortoise it says once upon a time a hungry leopard was searching for something to eat he had been prodding around all day without any luck his stomach was beginning to feel pinched as even as evening drew in he came to a clearing in the forest and there in front of him was a tortoise in one single swoop the leopard slipped down his paw on tortoise's back on tortoise's back Oh, please, cried Tortoise. I can see this is truly my end, but please, mighty leopard, just grant me a few minutes, Grace, before you devour me. I wish to prepare myself to leave this world. Now Leopard knew that Tortoise would not escape, or rather could not escape. He also thought that a little time would allow his stomach juices to prepare to receive Tortoise. I found that funny, by the way. As I am in a good mood, he growled. I'll give you five minutes. As soon as Leopard released him, Tortoise began to scratch furiously at the grass under his feet. He worked in he worked in ever-increasing circles. He hardly stopped to breathe. Leopard watched amazed. Whatever was Tortoise doing? When Tortoise used up every last second, he looked around the deep marks that he had etched into the ground around him tell me said leopard what why have you done this well replied tortoise from now on anyone who comes to this place will see that some creature put up a great struggle for life you may eat me but it is my struggle that shall be remembered listen to this again 
Well, replied Tortoise, from now on, anyone who comes to this place will see that a creature put up a great struggle for life here. You may eat me, but it is my struggle that shall be remembered. And then, because that was part of the letter that um, Dr. Salaji wrote his children, he just mentioned that story because it was apparently like any story with a tortoise was like the most relevant story or like the most common stories that they heard that they heard from their father or family members and it says my dear children do not worry i do not intend to be eaten up by any leopard but like tortoise i believe in the power of the stories we tell if we keep quiet about injustice then injustice wins we must dare to tell across the oceans of time words are mightier than swords like beverly naidu is she is so good with words there were so many comparisons so many similes so many metaphors that i came across so many word plays and i was like whoa you said that and i would repeat them again like right now if we keep quiet about injustice then injustice wins we must dare to tell across the oceans of time words are mightier than swords you're loving the bar so that is all my lovies um if you're interested in getting this book i got this book um i'm not gonna put it down in the description down below because i don't think but i will i'll try to find if they have they obviously have an address but i got this last year the year 2021 the year yeah we're in 2022 the year 2021 december the 23rd in melville that's in Gauteng at a bookstore it's it sounds like it's more like second hand but they also have um new books but this book specifically is a second hand book so it has been used before you can even see the condition it's still in perfectly good condition i don't know if you can see that like it's a bit dirty i don't think you can necessarily see that but yeah, man, it's also this book won the con the Carnegie. What? How do I even pronounce that? Um. Yeah, but it won a medal. It's a very good medal. Like it's very high esteemed medal. Um. Thank you for tuning in. Please, if you liked this video, do consider subscribing. Please like the video, leave comments down below, like let's engage on this. If you'd like a part two on this book, like even more depth because I tried to cover everything, gave you a summary and this video is quite long. I know, but like it was really an interesting read. I thought I was going to um, perhaps read the letters that Mr. Solaja had exchanged with his kids from prison. But um, because this video was long already, I figured I should probably not do this. But if you would like a part two of that where I actually share the readings or the letters that he shared with his kids or rather the communication between him and his kids, please do let me know. I will do that. It's really heartwarming. It's you could see that it was really heartfelt and they were in a lot of pain, but they also had hope for the future. And I think it's very courageous that through the mist of darkness light always prevails and that is something that i personally go by in my life that sometimes when things do not go the way we want them to go or the way we expect them to go you should always know that through the mist of darkness light shall always prevail that is why over rain-soaked clouds across the turbulent seas, the wings of my faith shall lift and carry me. That is one piece I wrote with someone um, a while back while we're still big in po on poetry. And it has kind of like became a prayer, honestly. Like, over rain-soaked clouds across the turbulent seas, the wings of my faith shall lift and carry me. It carries a lot of meaning. Like... If you want to think about it, sit on it, meditate on it, you'll realize how much weight it actually carries. And that is all from me, Mackies. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember to share, like, subscribe. I've said that 155 times already.